Well, hey everybody, welcome to Clopepe. My name is Wes Hagen. I'm the vineyard manager and the winemaker here. It is the 24th of June, 2013, and we are going to start a two-part series on how wine is made. I've been getting very general questions from, uh, from the YouTube videos and from uh, other sources, so I'm thinking that uh, people are a little bit hesitant to ask questions about how wine is grown. So uh, I'm just going to assume from my educational experience that that probably means that we can go back and talk a little bit about more about fundamentals. So this week we're going to talk about how wine is grown. Next week we're going to talk about what we do when we take the grapes out of the vineyard and bring them to the winery for production to turn them from fresh fruit into delicious fermented products. So today we're going to start with the vineyard. Now the most important thing in when you're starting a vineyard is not to grow what you like to drink but to grow the grapes that actually belong and match the site. So for instance, if I really liked Cabernet Sauvignon, but I was living in, in uh, the Santa Rita Hills, uh, I, I, I could love Cabernet all day long, but if I tried to go crab, grow Cabernet in such an amazingly cool climate, uh, we would fail. We would make very green, very uninteresting wine. So the first thing you need to do is match the site to the varietal. So uh, cool climate, Pinot Noir, warm climate, uh, Cabernet, Zinfandel, that kind of stuff. So um, the next thing, I, you know, obviously to grow what belongs more than what you love to drink and to match the site to the varietal is absolutely the first thing. Second of all, you have to choose a trellis. So a trellis is an artificial tree that lacks shade. In the wild, grapes grow up trees. They steal the tree's light. They take that light. They turn it into sugar and the fruit to attract animals to eat the fruit, take the seed to a different part of the forest, go to the bathroom, drop the seed, and new grape pops up. That's the way the grapes work. It's basically a bird feeder. Now, the trellis is designed to actually give the grapevine the same type of structural support that a vine would need from a tree or a bush. But instead of having lots of other leaves, and uh, the trellis is going to be bare uh, and allow as much as possible to allow that vine to move up into the sunlight to absorb as much sunlight as possible, really to become uh, a solar panel for absorbing light and turning that light into energy to grow the vine until the vine is tall enough. And then it uses the sunlight and photosynthesis to produce sugar in the fruit. Um, irrigation is important. After you've chosen the trellis that suits the anticipated vigor, if the vines are going to be huge and vigorous and grow 10 feet of canes every year, you need to split the canopy to get two canopies up so the sun comes in through the middle and through the sides. But if you have low to medium vigor, you can use a vertical shoot positioning trellis where you just have one sort of uh, curtain of foliage to absorb the morning light on the east side usually and the uh, afternoon side on the west. Uh, in the afternoon. So that trellis is going to do the best possible job of minimizing shade, getting as much sunlight into the canopy as possible. Now we talked a little bit about irrigation. Irrigation is important in most places that don't get at least 25 to 30 inches of rainfall uh, throughout the year. Um, the grapevine really uh, started, you know, uh, the European grapevine can find its heritage back in the Transcaucasus between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, as we've discussed before. And as a result, that area gets about 30 to 35 inches of rainfall a year. So that's its natural habitat. So if you can't get that 25 inches for what they call dry farming, then we need irrigation. And on the central coast of California, we're basically, we're basically in a desert. We get about 10 to 12 inches of rainfall a year, only 6 inches this year. So I was already irrigating this year, believe it or not, in December. So the vines would wake back up with a little bit of, uh, little bit of moisture. Um, so irrigation is really important. Obviously, the vine needs to get water throughout the season uh, to stay, uh, you know, everyone always says, well, you got to stress the vine. Well, that's not really that true. You want to make sure that the vine has all the capacity it needs to absorb light during the growing season to be healthy. And then near the end of the season, a little bit of stress can kind of reduce the, uh, reduce the water in the, in the berry and concentrate the flavor a little bit. But um, while a lot of people in the new world focus their viticultural attention on concentrating flavor, I'm more in the, the idea of healthy vines growing in a healthy way, produce wines that really represent a time and a place better than if you use a lot of tricks and tropes to sort of concentrate the wine and make the biggest wine you can. Now canopy management is the most important part of growing grapes. Canopy management means we are going to manipulate the area where the grapes are growing to allow as much sun and wind exposure as possible through that canopy without burning the grapes. So we want to pull as many leaves as possible and open up that canopy to sunlight and wind to reduce mildew and rot pressure and to increase flavor. 
because grapes react to sunlight by producing compounds that taste delicious in wine. And this is a really, really important thing that most people don't know about wine, is 90% of the quality of the wine is canopy management. If you get a wine that's green and it tastes like green bell pepper, it was grown in a shaded canopy and it has methoxypyrazines and those methoxypyrazines were never uh, removed by sunlight and the encouragement of terpenes and monoterpenes which smell like high tone fruit, raspberry, blackberry and red wine, uh, sort of more of a, a jasmine and white flower character in, in, in white wine. So uh, getting those flavors in the wine is all about opening up the canopy and making sure by hand when we pull leaves and we tuck the shoots and give those that canopy as much openness to that sun and the wind. Also think about when you're doing a spray, because obviously part of growing grapes either organically or not organically, everyone sprays. And when you spray, the efficacy of the spray is going to really depend on how much penetration that spray gets into the canopy. So if you have four leaf layers between the outside of the canopy and the fruit, nothing's going to make it into the interior of the canopy without massive pressure from that spray unit. So what you want to do is open up the canopy and get those nice canopy gaps, maybe 60% canopy gaps. So when you get down on the level of the fruit, you can see through to the other side of the, you know, just air on the other side. You can see through the canopy 60% of the place. I like about 80% canopy gaps on the morning side and 20 to 30% canopy gaps on the afternoon side. So if it gets really hot in the afternoon, the grapes do have some protection from leaves uh, on that side. So that's sort of the canopy management idea. So at the end of the season we start testing the fruit. So the grapes are going to turn from hard and green to soft and either golden and white wine or uh, red for the red grapes for red wine. And then when they turn soft the birds start looking at them. We obviously got to put nets over them. And after we get the nets on we start testing the fruit for sugar, pH, and titratable acidity. And what I like to see in white wine is levels of sugar between 23 and 25, levels of acid between 3.1 and 3.3, and titratable acidity somewhere between 6.5 and, and 8.5 and grams for a nice structured Chablis style white wine. Chardonnay with lots of acid, just the way I like it. Now in red wine, Pinot Noir, we're looking for harvest chemistry in sparkling wine between 19 and 21 degrees bricks, about 10 grams of acid and about 2.9 to 3.0 pH. And that's a very, very structured, high acid, low ripeness um, sort of style for making sparkling wine in the Method de Champenois. For our red wines, we like to see 23.5 to about 26 degrees bricks. 24.5 seems to be sort of my sweet spot for my own palate. We prefer to make wines with a little more elegance, a little more uh, transparency, not quite, uh, you know, alcohol levels around 14%. Uh, but we've made wines as high as 15 and as low as, as 13. So, uh, you know, the numbers don't matter. The flavor matters. So when we're doing testing, not only are we looking at the numbers, but we're tasting the juice constantly. And when we notice that there's a cherry flavor in the red wine or a kiwi aroma in the, in the, in the Chardonnay, things start happening and we start seeing the difference of those reference flavors that we taste in the wine. And when the wine, when the grapes look like they're at the right numbers, the right flavor, and the right acidity, we look at the weather and see, is there a heat spike coming? Is there rain coming? And we really, usually don't have to worry about rain, but if there's a heat spike coming, we may want to get the grapes out before the heat comes. So weather plays into it, and everything else plays into it, the, the flavor, the sugar, the acid, the pH, which are a little bit different. We can talk about that in the production of wine next week. So uh, we've Got to the point where we've done our testing. We're going to be harvesting our grapes tomorrow. So uh, when we uh, when we talk next week, we're going to be talking a little bit more about what happens when we take the fruit out of the vineyard and uh, what we do with the fruit in the winery to produce wine. So how to make wine, part one, uh, the vineyard. And uh, hope you guys have a good time. Ask some questions on the comment section. And we'll see you next week on Monday. Thanks so much.